It's now 2023, one year removed from 2022, and the world as it currently exists looks nothing like the world of soil and green. In fact, I'd say that in spite of my reservations about the current world, I'd rather live in 2023 than in 1973. But maybe this is because I like to look things up on my magic rectangle, and can download MP3s from Russia relatively cheap. The failure of the world to descend into the soil and green dystopia has to do with general trends not going according to plan, most of them to the benefit of mankind. In any case, in this video we're going to look at things that soil and green got wrong, some things that soil and green got right, and just some general commentary on the dystopia of soil and green. Um, well, the first point where Soylent Green got got it wrong was is when the director put up the caption "New York City population 40 million." Well, as you probably are aware, the population in 2022 was not 40 million; it's barely 8 million. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why this uh, population is not spiraling out of control. Um, one of the reasons is that in the post-war era, a lot of the people left the city because of the high taxes and the high standard of living and they moved out to the suburbs which uh, suburbs like New Jersey were, were actually affordable at the time uh, to, before they taxed them out of existence um, so um, then in the last 40 years the trendy started to bring it back so the other you know, young people moved back into the city and uh, apparently this uh, that came to an end with, with uh, in in 2020 with the the COVID-19 pandemic, where um, you know a lot, a lot of people start, um, well, basically like they, they shut down the city, the homeless people took over the the subways and crime uh, went out of control and and uh, there were people who moved out of the cities back back into the suburbs and. And a lot of people were like, the, the, for example, Dave Smith said that, uh, um, I don't want to have to explain to my daughter why the homeless guy is shooting up, shooting up on heroin. So I, I moved the family out of the, out of the city. Um, so, yeah. Was, um, so apparently, like, I think that, that once the hemorrhaging stops, the population will be at 8 million, but that's pretty much it. Um. But in order to understand why uh, they predicted the, that, the, that the population of New York City would, would uh, go to 40 million was um, because of a book called The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. Um, basically, this is a Malthusianism for the modern world. Um, so, according to Malthus, population increases exponentially while food supplies only increase in a linear fashion. Ehrlich predicts by the end of the 1970s, and this was not true, true, um, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. Uh, the solution he comes up with is population control. Um, but assuming that, that, that the individual decides that, that uh, he needs to um, reduce his offspring, um, what are the public policy implications, especially on a, a global level? Uh, Ehrlich is very clear about this, and, and uh, he sa says in the population bomb, "We must have population control at home, hopefully through changes in our value system, but by compulsion if voluntary investments fail." So you know, we see that his his view of the future is, is very negative, and he's also somewhat of a fascist. Um, but in reality, things didn't, didn't get to that level. Why, why is this true? Well, the last famine that took place in the Western world was the Irish Potato Famine of the 1840s. Um, since then, the narrative has been about increasing food surpluses. So that by the end of the 19th century, uh, food had gotten so cheap that many farmers were having a hard time making a living. Um, the free market answer to, uh, to this play the farmer was uh, learn to code. Well, not really learn to code, but just basically take up another profession. Um, so by now, very little of the economy is devoted to agriculture. 
Um, so, I mean, uh, government's got to intervene, so, um, uh, they, they, they went from, like, destroying, uh, food crops in the Depression to, you know, once the, uh, well, this is like the early depressions, the early days of FDR. Um, but then, the, the, once you destroy the crops, you could just basically pay them not to not to grow car- crops, and this ended in the uh, this was changed in the Eisenhower administration to uh, a a, uh, a price floor for crops if if uh, the the price floor is not met, then they will the government will buy the uh, the surplus f- food and give it to developing countries, and this creates a whole different problem for developing countries. That um, they give the food for free to developing countries, the farmer in the in the developing world can't compete with uh, with uh, free food, so this creates a whole problem for for. Uh, for the farmer internationally, but yeah, what what do you want? Um, so yes, um, and this is happening at the same time that women were introduced to contraception and birth control. So it doesn't seem that that the population bomb is going to to. Uh, detonate in the Western world. In fact, many countries, many European countries have uh, zero growth rate. Um, but what about the United States? Well, this is where I, you know, I start to look at the the um, the uh, birth rate in the United States. Maybe because I'm I'm just uh, chauvinistic about the United States. But anyway, um, it, in the Great Depression. The birth rate was very low. It was less than two. Uh, Population birth rate in the United States was below the replacement level, and the replacement le- level being two, because um, it's basically like two. Uh, a couple produces uh, two offspring, so basically they they replace themselves. Um, but yeah, the, the birth rate was less than two because the economy was in the toilet. People were not very optimistic about the future. Um, in the post-World War II era, something significant happened. The, the birth rate went to above three, the so-called baby boom. This was last until 1964. And you can see, in, um, I'm putting up a chart of... Uh, of the uh, birth rate in the United States. Um, this is the so-called baby boom. This lasted 1964. In 1965, the birth rate fell below three for the first time in almost uh, 20 years. By 1968, the, the year that the population bomb was published, the birth rate in the United States was 2.46. In 1972, the birth rate was 2.01. Um, population dipped below replacement level the next year. Um, so from 1973 to 1978, we have a below re- replacement level birth rate um, with all the population growth coming from immigration. I uh, saw researchers from 1989 to 1994, and again from 2000 to 2009 before it went into decline. And the uh, 2020 birth rate is 1.64. So, yeah, so it looks like you're not going to get a population bomb from the the West. You're not going to get it from Europe or the United States or Japan. Um, so what about the former communist world? Um, how about the former Soviet republics in Eastern Europe? Well, Russia had a population of 150 million in 1992. In 2023, it's 143 million and projected to go down to 121 million by uh, 2050. All future projections are really just estimates, 
but based on the low uh, fertility rate in Russia, this seems like a plausible future population. And it's happening for the same reason that happens to other countries. Uh, first of all, like, um, the economy is not doing that well. Um, women want careers and have discovered contraception and birth control. Population in Poland is also going down. It's currently at 38 million and will go down to 29 million by uh, 20, uh, 2100. Um, and the rest of Eastern Europe has zero growth or negative growth. Um, so if the first world and the second world aren't going to get a population bomb, what about the developing world? Here it seems that, that uh, this is, is suspect as well. Uh, for example, China had a birth rate of 2.74 in 1979. This was the year that pe the People's Republic of China introduced the one-child pol policy. Although this policy was revoked in 2015, the birth rate as of 2020 is 1.28. Again, the usual suspects are responsible. Uh, women want careers, discovered consciousness and birth control. So what about India? This is a country where women adapt more uh, traditional roles. Uh, here the birth rate peaked at uh, 5.97 in 1963. Um, and in 2020 it's 2.05, which is barely above replacement level um you could probably say that that one of the culprits is is de declining infant mortality rates infant mortality being defined as the death of an infant before its first first birthday um if there's a good chance that a child will at least live to one then there's probably less of a reason to have children at all and so th this is uh Admittedly, this is an oversimplification because I used India and China as a surrogate for all the developing world. Um, it's, probably, it's somewhat higher in Africa because uh, um, the more traditional society in Africa. But I doubt that we, we'd learn much if we looked into the statistics for individual countries. Um, so that's pretty much it. You're not going to get a population bomb from the first, second, or third worlds. And so yeah, this pretty much has not come true. Another part of the movie that was supposed to be prescient is when uh, they show the gap increasing between rich and poor. Uh, we see this depicted in the movie uh, with Thorne and Roth sharing a meager apartment uh, while Simonson lives in opulence in a fancy apartment with plenty of food, running water, and air conditioning, and furniture, and plus video games. Um, this is one aspect that comes close to home, um, but this we can, we can measure mathematically. Oh, we can measure this with the Gini coefficient. Uh, the Gini coefficient um, uh, with the Gini coefficient, uh, zero represents perfect equality, and one represents maximal inequality. Uh, there's uh, ways of calculating it that we won't go into, um, but suffice it to say that zero represents perfect equality, one represents uh, ine maximal inequality. Uh, the Gini coefficient for the United States in 2020 is 0 0.49, up from 0 0.43 in 1990, seemingly representing more inequality over the last 30 years. Um, well, it's, uh, this is a concern, but it's not really that much of a concern because technology is improving, so um, basically the, the, there'd be a... Uh, the one way to... to uh, to have uh, perfect equality is to destroy all technology. Once you start to improve technology, then, then inequality goes up. Um, but this does mean that amenities such as running water, electricity, and air conditioning are available to the ultra-rich alone? Well, not really. Uh, they're available to pretty much everyone. Uh, public policy... And then there's like issues where... Um, uh, people said that uh, when the progressive income tax was enacted in 1913, that, that uh, inequality went down. Um, so this, 
there's a there may be something to say for this, but uh, also see that the, the promises of the welfare state seem to exceed the ability of the state to deliver. Uh, take for example the case of public education. Um, so you know, there's uh, people say, well, we need to invest in human capital. Um, this is like uh, public education is basically an investment. Um, well. Currently, 25% uh, of high school graduates are f functionally illiterate. Uh, yet, you know that education is not hard to do. Um, the material that conducts schooling uh, costs at most a few hundred dollars per year. Uh, moreover, the best teaching material is available on the internet. Uh, you can, uh, for example, the uh, Khan Academy uh, has, has excellent teaching materials. Um, But your taxes go to pay for the teachers who provide a suboptimal output. And you're locked into this system where the teachers are 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 getting paid to uh, for mediocre at best output. Um, so basically, the schools are, were there, were there. They were they were uh, more or less uh, formed in the in the progressive era. To produce good factory workers, um, so they're kind of outdated because um, the United States is now firmly in the post-industrial age. Uh, the schools don't really have a clue as to as to how to how to produce the ideal post-industrial worker. Um, but still, enough places it it really doesn't matter. Because, for example, you have uh, cities like Baltimore, which had a lot. Uh, one time had a lot of factories and so um basically if, if they can uh read and write that's pretty much good enough for factory work actually they they can't because uh 25 percent of high school graduates are functionally illiterate but the ones that can read and write uh, you know they can work in the factory um but then you have people uh go to college they get a degree in uh, city planning, and and they find that uh, that oh, you can increase tax base if you develop the waterfront, and, and well, the waterfront is 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 owned by factories. Factories don't want to uh, sell, so we basically use eminent domain to to take to. Uh, take the factories and so we tear down the factories and build develop the waterfront well this is good because it increases the tax base of the city but uh, the factories are shut down and, and the factory workers are now unemployed um, so yeah this is an example where government uh, actually you know creates part of the problem uh, so I started thinking about this and there was a Mises Institute uh, article seven changes need in Baltimore and Ferguson right now by uh, post on uh, May eighth, twenty fifteen, by Mark Thornton. I think this is when there was there there were um, there were riots in Baltimore. Um, let's see. So here he has like a seven step plan. Here is uh, number one: grant urban blight status to free communities from regulatory dead weight. Number two, lower taxes. Number three, let workers learn real skills. Um, also, students trapped in public schools will be able to opt out of the last three years of high school if they can maintain a job working at least 32 hours per week. So this indicates that they probably are learning more from their jobs than in the schools. School the Students will also be able to opt out of afternoon classes in grades 7 through 9 if they can pass a basic company competency test and maintain a part-time job. Um, number four, legalize self-defense. So in other words, uh, do away with gun control. Number five, end the war on marijuana. Um, so yeah, this is probably a good idea. Uh, let's see, number six, sell off city property. I think they're kind of doing that already because you can buy uh, abandoned houses for a dollar. Um, and number seven, phase out welfare. Um, so yes, seven step the seven step plan basically says get get government out of the way um so yeah basically uh 
seems like it, 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 uh, first oil and green inequality is a problem, but it's not that much of a problem. Um, uh, and government is, causes part of the problem anyway. Uh, now, um, I think we, we can delve into like one of the areas where soil and green uh, got it right. Um, soil and green, uh, the U.S. government is increasingly authoritarian. And here I say they got things right, although you really don't see any of this in, in the movie. Uh, here you have Governor Santini, which is like not the federal government, local government. Uh, Governor Governor Santini wants to close the case of Simonson's murder, which he's just assumed it was a burglary gone wrong, if only to keep the secret of Soil and Green secret. Um, I would say that there's a definite swing towards authoritarianism after the September 11th attacks on the United States. Um, how has this led towards led towards the authoritarianism? Let me count the ways. Number one, the Patriot Act. Number two, the Department of Homeland Security. Number three, uh, the Transportation Security Administration, also known as the TSA, and airport authoritarianism. Um, number four, the increasing authority of the Border Patrol to where they have checkpoints within the United States. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, these are a few problems. These are just a few things, and this things like the FISA courts, and um, was it uh, the, the 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 Snowden revolution with the, the prison system? Um, but the and then once. Once the COVID-19 pandemic came to pass in 2020, um, a lot of opportunities saw th uh, this uh, apparatus as something that could be used to deal with medical misinformation and myriad anti-government agitators. And this is like the thing where a lot of people were, a lot of libertarians said that uh, uh, they we're against the Patriot Act and, and they said, well, this, this can be employed against you. And sure enough, 20 years later, it was employed against them, um, against conservatives, basically. Um, so, yeah, this is like one area that I think that I think uh, Soil and Green got it right. Um, so, uh, that's one for Soil and Green. Um, another one of the... the uh, areas where I think uh, Soil and Green got it right was global warming, at least to some extent. Um, although now it's called climate change because apparently like the temperature goes up or down and, and so they can say, well, we can say climate change is, is uh, the temperature either going up or down. Um, so uh, the movie somewhat accurately predicts this, although the most dire warnings have not come true. Uh, for example, I saw this article on uh, uh, RT.com uh, Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg has deleted a 2018 tweet in which she shared a warning that climate change, quote, will wipe out all of humanity, unquote, unless fossil fuels were abolished by 2023. Um, so, yeah, it looks like, like the most dire predictions have not come true. Um, um, in the Northeast United States, um, so apparently... Uh, there a few days when we had like 90 degree weather and it looked like we were going to have a hot summer um, but so far that's not happened um, again this is a it's currently July 30th and uh, dog days of summer not till August so we could very well have a hot summer but uh, we haven't had a hot summer so far um, so you know the advice to anyone who's dealing with heat will buy an air conditioner it's like there's Apparently in New Hampshire, they they don't have central air air conditioning, so it, they just use like room air conditioners. So this guy was talking about, well, you know, oh, oh, oh there's a heat wave, so I went out, I went to the appliance store and bought a 8,000 BTU air conditioner, and it cools the whole house. It's great, and so yeah, that's my answer to anyone who's dealing with heat: buy an air conditioner. So, it's, you heard me ranting about some things that, that were predicted in Soiling Green and 
were, what they got right and what they didn't get right. So I like to say in conclusion, in spite of all the disappointment that's come from the political sector, and there's been a lot of disappointment coming from the political sector, technology seems to march on. To give an example of a piece of technology that is a game changer, witness the iPhone. It's not just shaking up the cell phone industry, it has created the smartphone industry, pretty much decimated Blackburn and research in motion, and arguably has led to the decline of the mall, since a lot of devices we buy from the mall are now rendered obsolete, and this is all because of the iPhone. So I've this article here, um, this is uh, from the blog uh, www.trendingbuffalo.com. Um, everything from 1991 Radio Shack ad I now do with my phone. Um, let's see, so getting down to the, the, the uh, main gist of this article, the back page of the front section on Saturday, uh, February 16th, 1991 was four-fifths covered with a Radio Shack ad. Um, Radio Shack ad now no longer exists. Um, there are 15 electronic gizmo types on this page sold from America's technology store. Three, 13 of the 15 you now always have in your pocket. Um, so here's a list of why I replaced my iPhone. All-weather personal stereo, 1188. I now use my iPhone with OtterBox. AM FM clock radio, 1388, iPhone. In-ear stereo phones, $7.80. Came with iPhone. Micro thin co- calculator, um, five, $4.88. Swipe up on iPhone. Tandy 1000 t- TL3, uh, $1,599. Uh, I actually own the Tandy 1000, uh, used for games and word processing, and I do most of the, both of those things on my phone. Um, VHS camcorder, uh, $799, iPhone, mobile cellular telephone, $199, uh, obvious, mobile CB, um, $49.95, and says you'll never drive alone again, iPhone, 20 memory speed, Dial phone $29.95. Deluxe portable CD player $159.95. Uh, 80 minutes of music or 80 hours of music. iPhone. Uh, 10 channel desktop scanner $99.55. I still have a scanner, but I have a scanner app to iPhone. Easiest to use phone answer um, $49.95. iPhone voicemail. Handheld the cassette tape recorder, um, $29.95. I use the voice memo app almost daily. Bonus replacements, not for, uh, for sale, but at the bottom of the end, you're instructed to check in your, your phone book for the Rio Shack in your store nearest you. Do you ever even know how to use a phone book? Um, you have spent uh, $3,054.82 in 1991 to buy all the stuff that you can do now with your phone. The amount is roughly equivalent to about $5,100 and $2,012. The only two items that, that my phone can't really replace. Um, Tiny du- Dual Super Head Radio Detector, uh, $79.95. When was the last time you heard the term Fuzzbuster? Anyway, um, three-way speaker with massive 15-inch woofer, $149.95. So, yeah, this is a, a IT clone. clone. Um, yeah, that's, that's too much money. So anyway, this is a good example of like t- uh, how, in spite of the disappointments of politics, technology marches on. So in conclusion, I'd like to say this about the dystopia presented by Soylent Green. Number one, most of the predictions have not come true. Number two, this movie failed to see some of, some of the positive trends of the past 50 years, including, you know, the Green Revolution, which has fed the developing world. Um, and number three, despite the negativity voiced on this country by politics, technology marches on. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the, the, the negativity of, of politics. Um, so I was reading a, a Pat Buchanan's a book, The a Suicide of a Superpower, and uh, I don't agree with him on... on about economics, but there's one area where he hits the nail on the head. He talks about like when uh, 
George W. Bush uh, gave a speech where he said, well, oh, there's a problem because white folks own homes and uh, whereas uh, Hispanics and blacks do not own, as a group do not own uh, the percentage of uh, Hispanics and blacks that own homes is not as significant. Uh, so this is a problem. Well, actually it's not really a problem because if you just count Hispanics who were born in the United States, the differential is only about five five percentage points, so it's not really that great. And blacks not owning homes, that, that's a problem. And part of the reason may be because um, the breakup of the black family and, and uh, the welfare state has to do with that. So basically, you just uh, this is basically a solution to a government problem, so you may just get rid of the government problem to begin with. Um, so th I look at the the White House uh, website, and uh, this actually this is a George W. Bush dot White House dot dash archive dot gov. Um, so this is uh, increasing home ownership. Um, the U.S. home ownership rate reached a record of. Uh, 69.2 percent in the second quarter of 2004. The number of homeowners in the United States reached uh, 73.4 million, uh, the most ever. So, so it talks about this like as an accomplishment. And they basically did that by by lowering interest rates, and uh, basically this just facilitated the housing meltdown of 2008. So the bank bailouts were caused by this. Uh, so. Uh, basically, if they hadn't uh, done any of this, then they could have avoided the problem of, of uh, the ha the housing collapse and and, and uh, the uh, bank failures. Um, so yeah, so, but uh, so th this is a way of saying like basically, uh, you know, George W. Bush had a failed presidency, but then I mean. Uh, if you didn't get George W. Bush, you'd have Al Gore, so that's kind of a problem right there. Um, in fact, I, I'd say that idiocracy is a more accurate dystopia of the future of mankind than Soylent Green, and I may do a, a, a video review of uh, of idiocracy in the future, but right now I think I'm going to uh, do like uh, blackmail as my next uh, DVD review. So you're going to see that in uh, probably a few days. So stay tuned. So that's it for this video. Uh, like the video, comment on the video, and again, if you like this video, then subscribe to this channel so that you'll be uh, informed about future updates. Uh, as always, thanks for watching.